Gig Gab, episode 318 for Monday, September 13th, 2021. <music> Greetings, folks, and welcome. To Gig Gab, the show by, for, and about working musicians here in Durham, New Hampshire. I am Dave Hamilton, as far as I know. He, still, still Dave Hamilton. I think so. I don't know. Good. Yeah. All right. Well, you, you be you. And here in uh, Napomo, California, it's Paul Kent. And you are still Paul Kent. Always have been. That's excellent. That's you know it's, that's a that's a good thing to be confident about. I think I got to be me. You got to be you. You got to be you. Mm-hmm. How, uh, you have any gigs this weekend? How, how were your, uh, how are your gigs gig? Yep. You know, we're kind of going through this busy September. We had a one-off gig. So I had to do the drive about three and a half hours to do a one-off, but it was a great gig. Nice people to play for beautiful day. Uh, here's the biggest reflection from this gig. We haven't had a lot of opportunity this year where our sound guy has had ample time and ample space to um to set us up you know yeah yeah i i I understand this concern sure yeah we arrived he was pretty much done the the stage looked beautiful i mean just clear of all clutter we really walked in you know it makes such a big difference because the the flip side of that is when he's running behind because he didn't get access to what he needed or he didn't have enough help or whatever it might be and we get there and he's stressed because he wants to do a good job for us And then that stress is kind of like, guys, you know, pay attention, (laughs) you know, and then the band gets a little stressed and, you know, that eeps into the performance a little bit. But this was, this was like, you walk in, it was a two o'clock downbeat. The stage was set, sound was beautiful, plug in and go, you know, pretty much. And it was made for a great gig. So we, it was a long one. It was a three hour gig and uh, just really, really pleasant afternoon called a song I hadn't called in a long time. And remember where we have this new guy who's in well, with us on base, on base right now. That's right. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, uh, and, uh, you know, he, I asked him in advance, do you know, the song he goes, yeah, I said, we have a little twist to it, but just follow along. You'll be fine. And he did. And we did. And so we snuck another song in there. Which we what song was this to. now? Now it was the- satisfaction, but you know, oh, we, yeah, yeah. we stretch it in kind of a unique way and, sure. you know, have a little bit of a unique ending and a, you know, a, a little audience call and response thing. And, um, you know, God bless musicians with big ears, right? I mean, huh. that's so you know, key. <laughs> yeah, it really is. I mean, that's the thing. I've played with very good musicians who are emphatic that you have to play it to whatever original or or version they know, or yeah. you know, something like that. And they really can't budge. But you know, that's they can play the parts. But you know, are they really making music? You know, is, is the thing, right? Is yeah. this is where yeah. the whole team team sport comes in, and you know that it is. <laughs> you know how we always say that it is a visual, um, you know, event live music, but but it is also a a in the moment is what it makes is. live music interesting. So it is the ability to adapt and you know maybe tweak a song in some way to address the moment. I think that's part of the fun of making live music. <laughs> I am, I am reminded, I am not going to share the details of this story um, because they are irrelevant, but I am reminded of, of me on, on Saturday, I was overreacting to a whole bunch of stuff that was going on. And uh, in a text with fling, I, I said, <laughs> I, but my, 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 I'm quoting myself. I said, there's no I in team. And we're going to prove it. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> I, it was me. It wasn't, they weren't doing anything wrong. It was just, I was freaking out about a few things and, you know, yeah. stress gets to things. And so it was like, yep, there's no I in team and we're going to prove it. I'm not no, proud funny. of this. Although I guess I, I sort of am a little bit, you know, cause it's funny, but it's, um, it was a stressful moment, <laughs> but you know, the stress comes from that. Exactly what you just described. Y- you rarely have time even at a, a you know a perfect gig, you rarely have all the time you would want to get set up. I mean, some are much worse than others, right? Like, but but what you were describing for your gig yesterday, that's that's pretty rare to just, especially for weekend warriors, maybe touring bands, 
maybe, although I've, I've done some, you know, like D level touring and, and it's not always the case there, but, but certainly mo- I would say most clam bake gigs, you know, we'd get to the club at two in the afternoon or something for an eight o'clock gig. And we would have all wow. the time in the world to really get things tweaked. And then we'd go like have dinner, maybe even shower, like, you know, that kind of thing. But it's rare when you're a weekend warrior to have that kind of time. Right. And so that's where effectively, you know, the stress came from for, for me to, uh, to share that sentiment. <laughs> but yeah, it, it is a team sport. It's adaptability and, and you need that in people, quick response, adaptability, all of those things are big ears and, bi- and big ears, man. That's the big one. Yep. 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 It's, um, that's the man that that's those are the musicians I enjoy playing with the people, you know, I've always said that my favorite part about playing live is when there's, you know, an almost mistake or, or, you know, those serendipitous moments that you can't plan for. Some of them are mistakes. Some of them were just wonderful moments that happen in the moment, but yeah. I like them all for the same reason. It's, you know, all of a sudden there are however many people, you know, five, six, three, ten 10 people on stage all sort of working as one to create this thing that, that is happening. And that is, that's what I love. I really, yeah, absolutely. Do. Yeah. I had one other gig this weekend. So, yeah. you know, my friend Mel, uh, yeah. who is, he was a learning drummer. And, um, so we played a, a little house party at his house and it was great. I mean, it was really fun. And, uh, he's, you know, he works his butt off. He, he drums a couple hours a day. I mean, he's really determined to become a musician, which, you know, hats off to him. It's not easy to learn music. You know, you, you can kind of do some technical things, sure. but to be, be musical, you know what I mean? You know, like to, yeah. to play with groove and feel and that type of thing. So we played, it was mostly a three piece band. We have a, um, a woman who plays keyboards and sings a couple songs on a couple of them, but mostly it's bass, drums and guitar and a very good bass player. And, you know, Mel had a great night and he got to experience the fr- you know, the first time we did this, there were you know several people. It was okay, it was fun, but it was okay. Uh, but nobody danced, and he actually got to experience what happens when the music actually puts smiles on people's face, and all of a sudden people you know decide to go out on a dance floor, and that kind of rush that you get when you feel that you are connecting with people in that way. Yeah. It, the, I, I always say you know like. I didn't necessarily want to play dance music and having dancing be the only metric as to whether your band is successful is a bit of a mixed bag. What it is, is is it's the most obvious and easy way to metric this. It's a little harder to like gauge people's faces. And, you know, if, if, if you're playing music and it's just kind of washing over them, you, you know, it's a little harder on stage to kind of feel that vibe, right? But, you know, dancing is a, is a pretty easy metric. Although who, who famously said, you know, that, that, you know, music, all music is successful if it makes people move, right? I mean, that, like you said that, I don't know who said that, actually. Uh, you did right now, just now. You right. said it. Yeah, that was you. Yeah, yeah, that's, um, I, I, it, it's funny you bring that up because I had, I had four shows this weekend um arguably call them two gigs uh i played two shows with bitter pill on friday night at uh, 3s art space out in front uh out, it, sort of outdoors in portsmouth and a shout out to listener kevin who was in portsmouth this weekend he didn't couldn't come and say hi because i was playing but he texted me a picture of me playing and i was very surprised uh. yeah it was awesome uh so i maybe next time we actually get to to see each other like and say hello to each other, but, uh, but it was pretty cool. So we did, we did two shows there. We did a six o'clock and an eight o'clock and they, you know, clear the house. They were both sold out and, uh, and it's a tabled show. They, they created this sort of outdoor venue almost in their patio at three S art space last year, you know, because of the pandemic and all that. And they continued it through this year. We played there last year, we played there again this year, obviously. And, um, it's people seated. So certainly you could get up and dance, but it, you're eating food. They, it's, you know, it's a whole kind of thing. You can order food from this great taco place next door and there's drinks and stuff. So for the most part, people are seated um, through all of these performances. Doesn't really matter who the band is. And um, 
I noticed m people singing along, you know, those sorts of things. And it was like, OK, so, you know, they don't have to be dancing at all. Mm -hmm. it, you know, that is one metric. It's it's certainly an easy one. But being able to see people and, and what was really great was there was this one woman that was sitting right up front. And uh, I noticed her singing and it was like, oh, she. And then after the gig, I noticed her talking to uh, Emily. I'm like, oh, she must be Emily's friend or whatever. And then Emily came backstage because she was at the first show. And, and while we were eating our tacos backstage, Emily's <laughs> like, yeah, she's like, I had no idea who that was. Apparently she came and saw us at one gig over the summer. And now she knows all the lyrics and all this. And I was like, whoa, that's great. It's just, you know, it's, it's great. So that's huge success. Right. And and yeah. and no dancing at all. And then um, on Saturday night, I played uh, one gig, two shows, two shows, one gig. I don't know what you want to call it. We did this fling uh, barn jam kind of thing where we actually had three bands play. The church ladies opened up the night and then uh, fling played and then bitter pill played. So I played both of those sets, obviously. And I want to talk about the, the fling set in a little bit just because of some of the mechanics of it. But from a success standpoint, uh, it was fascinating. You know, there were people were seated and standing a blend of both a lot of musicians in the room, right? Because you got three bands playing for each other. Plus, you know, people that were invited uh, to this semi private party, we'll call it. But there were, you know, there's these moments that you kind of put it into songs. And it happens with cover tunes and original tunes. We were playing all original tunes all night, but, um, moments that you put into songs that are basically to please yourself. You, you know, you, you don't ever really expect to hear from the crowd how much they like these silly little events or maybe not so silly, but, but cool little events that you put into these songs. And every single one of them was met with applause that, that mm. and, and just reactions from the room that showed that they appreciated it just as much as we did. And it was like, wow, not only do they appreciate it, they noticed it like that, yeah. that was the most important thing. It was like, even if they hated it, the fact that they noticed this, this weird little thing that we put in just for this one moment of this song. And it was instant applause for all of those kinds of things. And, um, and that was like, that's my favorite kind of reaction, yeah. right? Like that, especially when we're playing an all original set and the same thing happened with bitter pill too. It was, you know, all these little things, um, that people were just catching, you know, and then reacting to and, and even like participating in and weird in, in, in ways that they haven't before. We have that, like I said, both in the fling set and the bitter pill set. So those, you know, those I call that level level two or level three. Right. Dancing's level one. Although it, people don't have to be da like, you know, da this is this is one step up. Like this is we're paying even closer attention to what you're doing and. You know, yeah. noticing like different, a uh, different harmony here versus over there and the people liking that. And like, I don't know that that stuff is cool, but it's, it's rare for me to play a gig and experience, you know, those types of moments. So it was really that part of this weekend was fantastic. Well, um, I got to tell you, yeah. the, one of the gigs I have that's an acoustic gig is a coffee house that at night is a music room. Mm. It's a music room in that. All the tables and chairs are facing the artist. There's some lighting. Um, there's not a stage per se, but there's an you know an area that's cleared for where the musicians will stand. And the vibe is, I can play like quieter music and more kind of message music, and people get into it. People sing along. They close their eyes. They let it wash over them. It is the most rewarding thing that I do, without a doubt. It is. Yeah. I mean, and I do, and I'm a lucky person. I mean, I have a wonderful band, and that fulfills my heart and soul and you know we connect with people but that's um that's uh you know i have to amp up my psyche to get into that place you know where where we're the party leaders and party masters right which some people are that person all the time great for them i'm actually not i'm actually you know much more you know what is the message of the song what is the lyrics of the song what is the space in this song you know, and, and where do I go when I listen? You know, that type of stuff. Mm. Singer songwriters would be probably more the most natural place where I go to get inspiration from music and to interpret music. So, so I, you know, having that opportunity to do that, it and it's a real rare thing because there's not a lot of 
music rooms. There are a lot of places where there are social environments where music is a part of it. Right. But people are there to, to either meet other people or to socialize with each other and their friends and, you know, whatever it may be. And there's yeah, you're, you're glasses. Emceeing, and there's, you're emceeing the party, but it's not necessarily all about you. Right. And and that's that's not there's nothing wrong with that. That that can no. be a great thing. I mean, I, like yep. I, that's what Steve Tyler says he does every night at Aerosmith gigs. He's right. like, this party is about everyone in the room equally, not just us on stage. He says, I'm just the MC of the party. That's it. You know, so which yep. is pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, on a similar vein, Nick and my band had the debut of his new project, the Stinkfoot Orchestra, which is a Zappa tribute, 16 pieces, 16 pieces, man. Yeah. And by, I, I told him yesterday, I wasn't able to get to the gig and I was really bummed about it. They had their debut gig. They sold it out nice. at a music room. And again, it's Zappa music. So that's almost self-selecting the people who are buying tickets to come see this, right? You are, yeah. you are opting into a musical journey, you know, that you have some background as to what you're, what you're there for. And, you know, I saw the videos and again, a people were just blown away to see a 16 piece band actually put together to play this. And he had like mallets and, you know, you'd have six, to, I mean, well, you wouldn't have to, and, but yeah. Yeah. Right. So. And, uh, and then, you know, the amazing thing is, Napoleon Murphy Brock, who is a singer for many yeah. of the Zappas album, lives in Nick's town. Nick found this out and reached out to him and just serendipitously, they didn't live very far from each other. So he's got a Zappa front man fronting his band. And wow. They were, yeah, it's a, it's a so big that, deal. Yeah, and, that's that's like tribute band plus one, right? Like, right? That, yeah. Yeah. Wow. And, and, you know, Nick's a picky musician, so he I selected hadn't noticed. musicians. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, he, he, he hand-selected people who, yeah. you know, could handle the chore. And uh, interestingly enough, the drummer is a good friend of his. And uh, I, I don't know the level of formal training that um, Michael Palladino had, yeah. but, but he has that bro relationship with Nick, and together they work through the drum parts for this stuff, and... You know, three plus hours of Zappa music later, we have a you know a drummer who is every bit on par with every other musician on this stage. So it, I'm I'm really happy for him, and it's actually another whole discussion that is worth having. You know, as a band leader, when my guys get involved in other projects, my instinct is to be like, oh, we're gonna have conflicts. You know, how am I gonna handle this? So, you know, as soon as I have to turn down a gig, some other guy's gonna take another gig and then I'm gonna have 10 guys with conflicts. And, you know, I, what I had was a fairly tightly reined in um, arrangement with the guys about availability and that sure. type of stuff. Yeah. Let me just say, Nick has, I, Nick and I have had no conversations about the, uh, about about my apprehensions and, and actually, he has let me know in many ways, no, the house rockers are still a big part of my life, which That's means great. a lot to me. That's great. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And it makes it a lot easier for, for me to, um, you know, really root him on to the greatest degree of success. And again, my life is different now. I'm farther away. Yeah. The house rockers are going to play a little less. It is a reality of my life that my guys are going to fill the other time. And, you know, the message of, of this has been, you know, my hope, and I will say this to the guys, my hope is, you know, you guys go out and, you know, get your jams on, you know, enjoy your life playing music. I hope that the house rockers will forever now be this welcome homecoming that when we do get together and get to do this thing that we've built for 22 years, that it feels like home, you know, right. that it feels like that foundational thing. And, you know, my goal is to actually buy it close to January 1st and mark out the week's that I've designated for house rocker gigs. You know, I know in the summer we'll have plenty of gigs to choose from so I can come funnel them into those weeks. Right. Yeah. So that's kind of my master plan is how that's to cool. tell the guys almost sort of essentially, in advance. essentially buy the, buy their, you know, reserve their weeks in advance yeah. and, and commit to filling them. Yeah. That makes yeah, sense. How would you feel if you were in the band and that was the way that I approached that? Um, like, you know, if, if, if Gary with the wedding band did that or whatever, that'd be fine. Like, yeah. you know, I, I mean, my the way I run my schedule is essentially and there's nuances to this, but essentially it's first come, first serve. Right. Like, it, you know, and, and, and if I know that there's going to be a lot of gigs for a, a certain band or whatever, I'll I'll be selective about what other gigs I might fill in with so that I can I can have some flexibility. But by and large, 
It's first come, first serve. So if you came to me in January and said, hey, man, uh, you know, I'm going to book the House Rockers these seven weekends over the course of the summer. Uh, mind leaving those open for me? No, absolutely. You know, put it on the calendar and then life's easy. That, like, yeah. that's fine. Yeah. 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 And, you know, I have the history that I will fill those mm-hmm. weekends. So it's not blind. Right. It's a, yeah. I would need to trust it in that moment. I would do a, you know, quick evaluation of, well, is this guy BSing me or can he actually like do this? And obviously, you know, I know you, I know how you book. I think anybody that listens to this show knows how you book. Like you actually mean it when that happens. Is it possible that one weekend becomes a, a you know, a half of a flop because something fell through? Of course. And you know what? That happens. And you know what? Having a night off ain't a bad thing, right? Well, the, so, the next the next level of of, uh, of process of this is hold those weekends for me. Please don't accept anything. And and I think, you know, like other bands I know have done this. Yeah. Hold those weekends for me. If I don't have anything booked within a 30-day window, go ahead and take anything last yeah, or Or if something comes up, call me before you take it. You know, and I'll let you know if it's yep. if I've got if, if I've got a line on something, then I'll let you know. And if it looks like it's not coming through, I'll let you know that, too. Yeah, that, yep. that kind of thing. It's, a you know, communication. That's it. Hey, I have a uh, a question related to communication about that. There is <laughs> there is one person in Fling that doesn't have a cell phone. Would you hire a musician if you, you know, you, oh yeah, great, man. You play, you know, whatever bass, like you're looking for a new bass player. So, you, you know, okay, great. Oh yeah. I'd love to play. Okay, cool. Well, give me your number so I can text you. Oh, I don't have a cell phone. What would that tell you in that moment? Um, yeah, I, I need communication. So <laughs> a last minute, last minute gigs come up and I yeah. need to hold everybody and get a confirmation. Yeah. If someone goes to the wrong place and I need to find them or something like that. I mean, yeah, I, I don't think I could. And, and you know, we actually had a, a, a guy who we were considering as a drummer before we settled on Russ. Yeah. Um, uh, he he was filling in on a couple of gigs, you know, when, when we were going through this transition. Sure. And that was essentially his tryout. And there was one gig where I hadn't heard from him. And, it, you know, it dawned on me that maybe – you know, is, did he have it on his schedule? And I was trying starting about three or four days before to confirm with him and I couldn't get a hold of him. Oh he was out somewhere, you know, camping or something like that. And yep, he didn't have it on his calendar. And, uh, and you know, we had to get someone literally a half hour before downbeat. Oh. So yeah. So, um, oh. yeah, I then just think today things move too fast. Opportunities come up, you know, I, 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 I need communication. That wouldn't yeah, work for me. No, I, just I, I do too. It, it, um, this person in Fling doesn't play in any other bands. So, you know, it's just Fling and we've sort of worked out our communication path, but, but I, you know, I was kind of thinking about that today. Like, wow. Like, could you be a working musician without having a cell phone? I don't think you could in today's world. No, no, I don't think so. No. <laughs> so, Hey, that there you go, right? The, the, you can play this portion of this episode. Keep our names out of it, and you're going to understand why in a minute. Uh, it, for the IRS, when they ask you why you write off your cell phone bill as a business expense for your music business, like that's a thing. Talk to your accountant before you you know send in that return. But uh, but if you're using your cell phone for music, you know, like why would that not be? a valid write-off. Similarly, your internet access at home, a valid write-off for yeah. your music business, right? And if you're, if you're filing a Schedule C, you're running a music business, right? Like, And so there's lots of things. Your mileage, of course, your instrument, you know, your your picks and strings and heads and, you know, all of the consumables and all that stuff. But, um, but yeah, but you're, again, you're at, technology. Ask your accountant. But ask your accountant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we're not accountants. No, no. We're just a bunch of idiots with microphones. So, by the way, these microphones are tax deductible, too, according to our accountant. <laughs> hey, we don't have a sponsor for this episode, but the company, my company, Backbeat Media, that uh, sort of manages and books all our sponsorships is doing a listener survey and is giving away 50 bucks to e- to one of each of every hundred people that fill out this survey. And we would love, we, it really helps us to learn more about you. And we're even asking you some questions about the show. 
in that survey. So there's a link in the show notes to this. That link will take you there and we will know that you came from GigGab. But here's the deal. Because we're giving away 50 bucks. Actually, we're giving away a lot more than 50 bucks. Uh, but yeah, because we're giving away these $50 Amazon gift cards, people are trying to game the survey. And we knew this going in. So the first question of the survey is which show sent you to this survey? Again, I've already told you the link tells us which show sent you. You're answering that question so that we can match those two up and qualify you for the survey. Right. right. There you go. So please go fill that out. We would love to hear your advice. And 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 there's some questions. I mean, there's some, you know, like demographic information or whatever. And, and uh, obviously, you know, that's very helpful to us for that side of things. But then there's also some questions uh, about what you like about the show, what you don't like about the show, and even an open-ended one where you can send us some, uh, you know, your thoughts about it. So uh, we promise the survey won't take you very long. We, we really kind of narrowed it down and whittled it down, but, uh, but we'd appreciate it if you take a minute and fill it out. And there's a link in the show notes. So, but I'll, you know what? I'll also link it to giggabpodcast.com slash survey. I promise I will make that happen. Before you hear this episode. So there you go. Um, Paul, I found a, uh, a cool thing. I have this, we have this rule in our house that we don't buy things based on Facebook ads because otherwise we'd just spend all our money there. And if you want to adopt that rule in your house, good news, because the thing I'm about to tell you about, you didn't find from a Facebook ad. I did, but you didn't. And so, you know, there you go. And this is for drummers. But if you have a drummer in your life that you love, by golly, listen to this. This thing is called the kick block. And then there's a, a related product called the pedal block. You know, if, if you're a drummer, you already know this. If you play with drummers, you might have seen drummers do this. Their kick, their bass drum and their hi-hat pedal might creep forward through the gig and you see them reach down and like, you know, cinch it up and pull it back in towards them. That sucks, Right. They don't, the rug doesn't always hold these things. Well, the kick block fixes that. It's this little piece of really hard foam with Velcro on the bottom of it. And it sits in front, the kick block sits in front of the bass drum. The pedal block sits kind of right around the hi-hat pedal. And that Velcro holds onto most rugs that I've used. I've been using this thing for about three, four weeks now. It's life-changing. It's like putting, and these things weigh nothing because they're just foam, you know, uh, it's, it's like having a, you know, a 30 pound bag of sand there to keep mm. things from moving. It's amazing how well this stupid thing works. And it, like I paid, I think I paid like 30 bucks for the, for the two things, maybe 35 or something. So I get the kick block and the pedal block all in one. I mean, it's not expensive by any, I mean, it's, you know, it's a piece of foam with Velcro on it. Yeah, yeah. Let's be honest about what it is. And solves the problem. It, it solves the problem. It's lightweight. I just keep them in my bass drum case, like, like the, the actual drum case for the bass drum. I just tuck them in on the side. They're not going to bang up the drum or anything. And, uh, it's amazing how well this stupid thing works. Very I figured cool. for whatever, 30 bucks or whatever it cost me, it was way less than 50. Let me put it that way. Um, you know, I figured, well, it's, it's worth a shot, right? Oh, no, 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 no. It, this is now a mandatory part of my setup because it. But it, this, this begs the question, why do you have a rule in your family that you can't buy stuff that's advertised on Facebook? There's well, we've, we've had a problem with this, Paul, clearly. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, what, but what's the difference in Facebook or Amazon? What, what is the difference as to where you. I, I, yeah, I don't know. Facebook ads. It, you know what it is on Facebook and the Instagram ads? It's things like this, like these little you know, $20 things that you're like, Oh, that might be useful for me. Right. Like they're, you know, these un, they're, they're not, not commercial products, right? They're, yeah. they're, they're, they're little, you solutions. Know, little solutions. There you go. Well, the problem is you wind up not only spending money on these little solutions, but they just accumulate in your home. These yeah. little, you know, it's like what has happened is we have completely democratized Ron Coe's as seen on TV, right? It used to just be Ron Popeil. And now it's anyone with an idea that knows how to make, you know, get, get in touch with a factory, which also you can figure it out on the internet. So pretty much anybody that has an idea that wants to take it somewhere. Now I always it say slices, it dices, it slices. See, set it and forget it. And that's what you do with the kick block. You set it and forget it. <laughs> All right, I'll tell Russ about that. Maybe, maybe Santa will come and put one in his stocking. Uh, yeah, hopefully early, because the, the day you get one of these is the day you wish you had it for the prior, you know, few decades of your life. So, did uh, you ever notice that uh, the rug that that uh, that Russ has? 
Mm-mm. Oh, <laughs> so his rug is um, kind of a, a a drawing of of where everything goes with well, numbers. Smart. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. when we do have a drum tech or a drum roadie, which is you know, yeah, we've been having Not- the hardest time finding someone to, to roadie for us to do that type of stuff. But sure. anyway, he's got it nailed down to a process. Like literally, hi hat right. goes on number two, kick drum goes on number four. You know that type of thing. Got it totally wired. That's smart. I, I like Not that. Not on Facebook though. No, that's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. I always that's a good idea. That's a that's a good way to solve that problem. I always felt uh, a little bit. Uh, I don't know what the right word would be. Jealous isn't the right word because I mean I could make one, but it would be cost prohibitive. But Neil Peart, uh, his drum set. Happy birthday to Neil, by the way. Happy birthday yesterday to Neil. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, his drum set. What he had no. Um, his stands screw right into a platform. Like there are no legs. There were no legs for any of his stands. They would just screw straight down into a platform into, you know, predefined spots. So it's taking the Russ, the concept that Russ has on his rug and bringing it one step forward where you're not just saying this is where it goes. You're putting a receptacle there and that is where it fits. Like there are no legs, none of that stuff to get in the way, which is beautiful because having stand legs in the way is the entire reason you get a drum rack. Most people think it's for different reasons. That's the big one. You actually have a smaller footprint on stage when you don't have to have stand braces everywhere. But yeah, his was just, they just drop them in, boom, 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 boom. And the drums are in exactly the same spot every night. They never move and you definitely don't need a kick block. So, um, (laughs) well, I mean, it's, you know, it's welded in there. It's not going anywhere. (laughs) If it moves, you have a much bigger problem on your hands. So, yeah. Yeah. But I, but Russ is like, like that solves that problem. I I've known some drummers. I knew this one guy that would bring a tape measure with him and he knew that, you know, from the, whatever the edge of his stool, like the, the feet of his stool to his bass drum was, you know, 14 and a half inches or you know, whatever it was. He, and he would like measure it all out and get it exactly right. And I was like, wow. I mean, you know, whatever I, this is, it's tough for drummers, right? Because if I said to you, when you get to the gig tonight, you have to set up the action on your guitar because we've just taken all the strings off it. We've taken everything apart. Here's all the pieces for your guitar. Build Start it. Start again. So build it before every single gig. And then and then when the gig finishes, take it all apart and put the pieces in, in cases and bring them home. Right? That sounds yeah. insane, but that is exactly what happens with a drum set, right? Is like the action is slightly different every night. A rack fixes that too, right? Because you've got things that are are set in the same spot. And so you can you can have some of that. But it's it's a tough thing. And it's, you know, it, I experienced some of that on Saturday. We had a, uh, we had the church ladies play and Tim and I went back and forth and with the way my schedule was and all that, we wound up using Tim's drums, which was probably a mistake. Uh, I mean, I was, you know, I agreed to it uh, up front. It wasn't, you know, but, um, you know, he played one set, I played two and, you know, I said, oh, send me a picture of your drums before I finally, you know, agreed to this. And there was this gorgeous, yeah. gorgeous set of Gretsch drums. I mean, they, they, they were painted this like or burnt orange, uh, like, like almost a red color, but matte. I, like It wasn't painted. I'm, I'm assuming it was a wrap on them, but gorgeous drums. And uh, I was like, oh, okay, the way he sets them up, that looks okay. And then, you know, I sat behind him and it was like, right. I mean, it's not anything close to what I would use, which is exactly how every drum set is. Like you might look at a a set of drums and be like, oh yeah, it looks pretty much the same as any other set of drums. But the nuances of that are, are completely different most of the time, unless somebody has got like a four piece kit and then you can like nudge things around and, and sort of make it fit for yourself. But anything more than that, things start getting crazy. And, um, you know, and, and the way he tunes his drums works for him didn't work for me at all. Um, you know, they were they were actually kind of extra loud in this room. Um, yeah. But but even but, you know, it, the, it's the way that he plays versus the way I play. And and, you know, you kind of set your instrument up to be the way that that works for you. It becomes an extension of you. And that's true of a guitar. That's true of a set of drums. That's true of a keyboard, whatever, you know. And his cymbals were very different from what I would choose. And, you know, we only had 10 minutes between bands to, um, 
to, you know, to transition. And so using different drum sets was not really in the cards for this gig. I, sh I should yeah. have said we should have just used my kit because I was playing, you know, 66% of the night or whatever. But I was trying to be a nice guy. And um, yeah, it was. But it's an interesting thing. The challenges of sharing a back line, right? Like it, it um, I said before, it was Fling's first gig doing uh, with everybody on in-ears. Right. Aaron and I have used in-ears over the years. Uh, but that's it, right? The other three guys, this was their first gig. We rehearsed in this barn where we played the gig on Wednesday night. So we didn't just have to race to get set up. Although we get to setting up on Wednesday and Aaron tells us, oh, you know, I've only got like, you know, an hour and a half left. We're like, okay, well, I guess we do have to race to get set up because otherwise we don't actually get to rehearse, you know? So, um, so, we, but we got set up and, and the guys were able to kind of get their mix dialed in and, and that sort of thing. But then, you know, with other people using the back line and all that, um, it becomes imperfect, which was a sort of a good experience for the guys to, to understand that, you know, your goal with in-ears, you, you have to learn how to quickly get your mix set up and, and, and they did pretty good. You know, I mean, you and I've talked about this ad nauseum over the years, um, I think they did pretty good. They understood you start from zero and bring it up from there and, you know, start bring yourself up first. Like we talked about with Dan East. And if you didn't hear that episode, we'll put a link in the show notes to it. Cause it's super valuable, but, um, but yeah, you know, that, that sort of thing, but they were, we got to the end of the gig. They're like, so that actually, you know, like they all said, I wish it could have been better, but man, that was so much better than using monitor wedges. And I see the future. Like I see the potential of this, of being able to hear exactly what I want. It's like, well, well, I, I, sometimes. I gotta tell you, my, my friend, <laughs> you know, I've gone back to bailing on the, the in ears, and especially like the gig I had that we talked about at the top of the show. Yeah. Bill dials my monitors in for me. I hear myself crystal clear. They get over all the volume on the stage. Do you wear earplugs probably. though? I don't, and I probably should. Well, here's the and thing. What, if what you, Simon does is Simon, you know, wears in ears, but he pulls one out a little bit and basically does his own porting, his own yep, blending of, yep. of ambient and, and stuff like that. And and that's okay. But all I got to say is, net net, feeling the show is still a very very real thing for me. And you know that I for all the conversations you and I have had. When I say, yeah, I'm just really sensitive. And when things happen and change over the course of a gig, I can't, as the front man for the band, have my mixer on a, on a mic stand right in front of me. You I know, mean, you I mean, could. I, you know, you say that you can't. I'm, I'm all over the place with the, with the mic stand, with the mic, and, you know, all that type of stuff. And so, but you could have it back know, by your guitar amp. And go you could, know, give it a quick tweak between songs. I mean, I'm a drummer. And never I'm, a quick, it's never a quick. I mean, how do you do that? Between songs. You turn it down a little bit and something else is different. And then you have to readjust, you know, the only way to do it is in the middle of all things are happening. Right. And that's pretty impressive. No, I, I do it between songs. I rarely make adjustments mid song. I, I have, mm -hmm. but generally it's, it's between, you know, I'll, I'll notice something in the middle of a tune and uh, be like, okay, uh, you know, when this song ends, I'm going to bring, you know, that guitar down a little bit or whatever, but it, it is one of those things where it, you are used to hearing without in ears, right? Like you're used yep. to hearing naked. And so it is different. And, and until different becomes normal, it will always be what you're experiencing. Like you are not, you are not unique in this way and, you, and you're not alone. Everybody prefers what they're used to. You need yeah. to get it to a point where you are used to your in ears. So I, I well, I, but, but I would say, don't give yourself any opportunities not to use them. Your acoustic gigs, use in-ears. Your rehearsals, use in-ears. Just like commit 100% and you will get there. I, I Trust me did. on this. That's the, <laughs> that's the key. <laughs> As someone, I mean, I fought with this for a long time to get there. How many, how many episodes have we done? Yeah, this is 318. And, that's right. And how many, how many... How many years before we started doing this was I asking you for advice on this stuff? Uh, probably 18. Many. Yeah. That's yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love you, Dave. No, it is. You just have to commit though. Like that's the only way to get there. It's not ever going to be, you know, like one experience can be like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. I mean, you've had those amazing experiences, right? You know, few and far between, but you have them. That's not enough to convince you to do it. You, you just have to commit and be like, nope, I'm taking the monitor wedges away.
That's it. So now I use in ears and and then things get way better. Um, but it but it it's hard for everyone and it's especially hard for guitar players. Yep. It really like it it really is. But you if you're gonna do it, you just need to commit to it. And and then you'll get there. I but acoustic gigs made a big difference for me because I I no longer had that point of comparison of, oh, here's what it's like singing into a microphone, hearing it over there. You know, now I'm just always, it's just in my ears. It's fine. It's how it is. So yeah. I don't know. It's a, it's a tough thing, man. Yeah. It's a tough thing, but it's fun. You know, I don't know. I don't know. You got anything else, man? Uh, no, we're kind of coming to the end of this three month run of lots of gigs and, and uh, I'm quite reflective about it, and it's going to make some for some interesting shows. Is you know we we finally you know figure out finalities to hopefully having a bass player for the next twenty years, and and you know we were just about to start a path of saying, hey, do we want to have a show where we add ten or fifteen female singer songs and market that you know as a part of our business, you mm. know, to put it out there. But that's that's a little bit on pause here. We were right before COVID. We had started on about ten or fifteen kind of more top forty ish newer type things. Because again, we are you know we're trying to balance this you know great ongoing set of gigs that we get the, these festivals and and club dates and and uh, concert series. Yeah. But we you know we. Ha- over half of my band makes makes their living from music, and so you know we were we were going to say hey, and remember we did that in really interesting episode that you just don't wake up one day and say I'm a wedding band, right? Yeah. So we were starting to ad- address the realities of of getting more corporate work, and some of it was like you know especially in Silicon Valley where the workforces are younger and younger. You know, like when you hear what they play at the parties that we play at in between our sets. It's very different. So uh, we were just starting to adapt that stuff and we had to put kind of put it all down. Sure. Uh, you know, and so we've got some really fun reinvention challenges ahead of us that I look forward to kind of talking through with you. Yeah. Well, and then there's going to be, at least for us here, probably a, if not a stop, a massive reduction in the number of gigs that, um, that I'm playing here. Uh, I, I, you know, I'm not sure what's going to happen with indoor shows. Uh, we don't really have any indoor shows booked. This barn show on Saturday was technically an indoor show. I mean, they had the barn doors open and it was, you know, like I said, it was all vaxxed people and it was friends of friends and, you know, a very sort of controlled environment on very much unlike a club. Right. Right. Every, everybody knew somebody knew somebody there, right? It, it wasn't just random people. And so um, I think, I think gigs are going to slow down. And so I'm going to have that reflective moment of like, all right, well, we had the summer of 2021 and uh, we got to play all these great gigs and it was magical yep. and you know, and what? So I'll be curious to see where we are in two months. What, what I'm, I think that, what that I'm it's going to be a really interesting period. You know, remember the episode we did where you said we're not going to have a soft landing, right? Mm-hmm. Remember, we, you know, we talked about this at length. I actually think quite a few people are going to kind of go through, all right, well, we did gigs. There's a lot of people there. How do I feel about there being a lot of people yep. there? Is my life playing indoor gigs <clears throat> going to get relooked at? What do we want to do with our band moving forward? And again, this, all this, creates opportunity for other bands. You know, if, if, if the house rockers aren't going to do club gigs, that's going to open up some club gig dates in this area that other bands can, can fill. And so I, I think it's actually, it's just so interesting. You know, again, we work in this, in this interesting world where we, we want to be creative. We want to respect the value of our art. Um, uh, you know, we have certain business things that we have to take care of, but we, we want to feed our creative side. There's so many things that go into running a band yeah. um, and and now add a changing world that just had bigger things thrown at it that are going to, you know, I'm sure there are going to be some musicians who are like, yep, can't do it anymore. And maybe those roles will open up for other musicians or maybe sure. more new. And again, is it going to open it up to 
part timers who are willing to do it for free? And, you know, is it going to further dent things? I think. Well, and this is, and, I mean, like the, the with certainly with Fling and Bitter Pill, Fling is is on the cusp of releasing probably five, four to six new songs that we've recorded ac- over the summer. Uh, Bitter Pill is going to take the time in the fall that we know we're probably not going to be playing indoor shows. And we've got a writing retreat weekend that we're putting together to, to, you know, solidify and work on some new material. And then we've got a studio weekend where we're going to go back to the noise floor and, um, and lay down some more tracks and put out another record. And so there's like, there's things you can do with your band when you're not playing, especially as you, you know, I mean, the way I kind of look at this is here, you know, things get cold enough in the winter that it, outdoor gigs just are like an outdoor yeah. New Year's gig is, is in, impractical. That's correct. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, it's come April. OK, even if things are as they are now, like outdoor gigs, certainly realistically likely will happen again next year. And maybe we'll be able to do some indoor gigs like over the winter as as things evolve. Right. We We don't know. But, you know, to take six months and say, okay, we're going to make a record. We're going to do this other thing. We're going to do some promotions. Maybe we do some merch sales online. Like in addition to music, we'll sell, you know, shirts. And I don't know, maybe you want a bitter pill sweater. I don't know. Maybe you want a, you know, a bitter pill hat. I like to keep yourself warm in the winter time, like those sorts of things. (laughs) But you know, that kind of thing to keep a money flowing, but also be people just interested and aware of the band and engaged with the band so that when the time comes, the time comes that we can schedule a show. Well, it's like, Oh, it's uh, people aren't like, Oh, I forgot about that band. It's like, no, I've been waiting for that band. Like that's, you know, and, and we get to control our destiny in that regard. We can certainly choose to go and disappear. And if we do that, then we have to rebuild at some level. And so we hopefully won't have to rebuild. Hopefully you won't have to rebuild, Yeah, but it is the, the world isn't done changing from this last set of yeah. circumstances that we've been all dealt in. That's right. It'd be interesting. Smart people will be light on their feet. Yep. You know what business you need to be in? Tents. The guy selling tents is probably having a really good year. Mm, interesting. We just play gigs and then it doesn't rain. So, you know, that works out. I so you control on. the weather. That's the key. I, should, I just knocked on wood there so that uh, because I because <laughs> I have a, a, a gig on Sunday, which now I've definitely cursed Dude, us. You screwed. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Whammy. Yeah. Yeah. But it, but this summer, Bitter Pill has been effective at controlling the weather. So, you know, Evan, maybe that's our deal with the devil. I don't know. You know, uh, so. But you could get a couple more months out of your out of your playing schedule if if, you know, gigantic tents in in ample spaces with yeah. space heaters. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I mean, at at some point, though, how much like an indoor venue is like, have you created an indoor indoor venue outside, right? Like you, you start protecting, you start shielding yourself from the elements too much. And now, you know, there's not a whole lot of difference between just going in over there as opposed yeah, to. Being, I don't know the answer to that. I don't think there is one like that's yeah. that. Yeah. Cause I've done, you know, like when indoor dining started up early in the year, it was like, Oh, okay, well maybe we can go. And and we went to, I remember going to one place and it was like, they're like, Oh, we have, it's covered. So it doesn't matter if it's, you know, blazing sun or raining or whatever. And we went, it was like, well, it's covered and also shielded on three sides. And it's like, well, I mean, technically this isn't indoors because there's no building permit on the structure. Yeah. But like, eh, you know, and obviously we made it through the meal fine. It was all that, but it was like, this felt a whole lot less like outdoor dining <laughs> than it did like indoor dining. So I, you know, I don't know what, I, I don't think there's a real good answer there. Um, mm-hmm. Certainly not an economical one. I mean, you could certainly leave all the sides open, cover the top and, and just, you know, heat the daylights out of it, but that starts to get really expensive. So I don't know. Yeah, you know, we'll see. We'll see what happens. I got a couple of shows, a oh. couple of concerts I'm going to this weekend and then a couple of um, things, but the concerts are all vax, you know, vax, vax or test mandate kind of thing, which is, I'm really curious to see the results of all that um, as it sort of comes out in the wash. It seems to be working out so far, which is good, I guess. Yeah. All right. Well, we said we were going to do a short one and we failed. So is it just time to uh, wrap it up? 
Wrap it up. All right. Well, thanks for listening, folks. Feedback at giggabpodcast.com. Make sure to go to giggabpodcast.com slash uh, survey. I knew there was something. Or just click the link in the show notes. I will make sure that uh, that it all works. And, um, and fill out that survey for us. We really appreciate it. And we will uh, we'll see you next time. Have a good week, Dave. Hey, buddy. Yeah, man. Outdoor, indoor, whatever you're doing, do me a favor. What's that? Always be performing. Ah, great advice. Great advice. You too, my friend. You too. I shall. I shall.